Hello, boys and girls. Greg from the Scary Spirits Podcast here. Time for another cocktail. This week's cocktail is the Snowdrift, and it is the featured cocktail in today's episode, as always. We start with our shaker of ice. To that, we're going to add chocolate liqueur. One ounce. Next, hazelnut liqueur, another ounce. Vodka, one ounce. Finally, heavy cream or milk. I'm using almond milk because I'm healthy like that. Three ounces. Then we shake. And we're going to strain into our martini glass. There you have it, boys and girls. The snow drift. Pretty good. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy the podcast. See ya. I'm sure you've heard the old saying, follow the money. On this week's episode of the Scary Spirits podcast, The Changeling, a listener request, by the way, money shapes the whole horrific story. Sure, grief and ghosts definitely play their parts, but money is the ultimate villain. Money, of course, is not inherently evil, but how you get it just might be. It all begs the question, what would you be willing to do to get more money? My advice, try to keep your soul intact. Cheers. Welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast. Please be advised that the presenters may use adult language and or discuss adult situations. This podcast is not intended for younger listeners or those that may be easily offended. So if you're ready, let's go. Hello, boys and girls. I'm Greg. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen. And welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast, the podcast that combines the two very different yet highly compatible worlds of scary films and alcoholic spirits. What could possibly go wrong? Indeed. How are you, Karen? I'm doing great. How are you, Greg? I'm good. Thank you, Karen. It was a gorgeous day here today. It was. A little windy. windy, Yep. I was in, I stayed on, in, inside all day and watched TV, Karen. 
<laughs> that was an excellent use of your time, Greg. Excellent. <laughs> Including this movie. Speaking of which, Karen, I believe this was your choice. No, it's a listener choice. Another one? We're popular. What can Two I say? Two in a row. We love them. More, more, more. Send us some more. Yeah, it's less things for us to contemplate. Yes, it hurts our tiny brains. <laughs> Come up with a movie. Come up with a drink. <laughs> what film has our listener, who I guess is remaining unnamed, Karen? No. Oh. Tanya. Tanya. Tanya picked this. Okay. It's all on her. And she picked The Changeling from 1980. Apparently, it's one of her favorites. Okay. George C. Scott's birthday was just last week. So there you go. She's on top of things. Apparently, she, knows she how, is. She knows how this works around here. <laughs> is she so on top of things that she even provided a cocktail? Well, she did. And if you listen to last week's podcast, she has champagne tastes and caviar dreams, our Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> because she picked a... A drink that would have gone very well. It would have. With the film called The Carmichael. Yeah, she did well picking it. Yes. But then we researched the ingredients, and they were a little pricey for us. Of course, we, I didn't have any of them. Did you, Karen? No. <laughs> okay. Not when it's $138 for a <laughs> bottle. So no. So she was then gracious enough after we reached out and said, um, a little too pricey. <laughs> And came up with another one called The Snowdrift. And I see what she did there too, Karen. Yes. After so watching the movie. She's good. And, and it I didn't think take she, long to realize what she did there. She um, favors you, I think, because this is a total Greg drink. You're going to need one ounce of chocolate liqueur, one ounce of hazelnut liqueur, and one ounce of vodka, along with three ounces of heavy cream. You want to know what to do? Yes. Throw all that and shake her with an ice. Shake vigorously for 30 seconds. Pour vigorously? The, yes. We do like a vigorous shake. <laughs> Pour through. Well, who doesn't care? <laughs> <laughs> we don't like to be poured through the strainer, but we like the vigorous <laughs> shake. Into a martini glass. It says there should be some ice crystals. I didn't have any of those. That's because but... you didn't shake vigorously for 30 seconds, Dan. <sighs> Just not vigorous enough. Mine is light and frothy, though. Mine is as well. And you can use milk to be substituted for the heavy cream if you like. It's delicious. It is. It's very good. It's I did almost, substitute milk. I know it would be better with heavy cream. It almost tastes like a melted milkshake. And you know what I really wanted to do? I wanted to use some of that DiSerono cream. Oh, that would have been good. It's not really a heavy. I, I don't know if it would have been thick enough or something. I don't know. Probably but, not. But I bet it would have been delicious. <laughs> it would have been good. <laughs> tasty, tasty. Yeah. Add that little bit almond liqueur in there. And man, it's like a chocolate brownie with almonds. <laughs> should we give our friends and listeners time to make their own snow drift, Karen? Yes, we should. Hold on. And we're back. Yes, we are. Might you have a brief synopsis for us, Karen, of this film from 1980? I do. Go on. Tell us all a story. In suburban Seattle, John rents a large, and that's not even an adequate term to describe the house, <laughs> large, old and eerie Victorian era mansion and begins piecing his life back together. However, John soon discovers that he has unexpected and unwelcome company in his new home, the unhappy ghost of a murdered young boy. Thank you, Ken. We are not a match. But yours is fine. Oh, you want to read yours? Nope. You don't want to share with the class? Mine gives a lot more away than yours does. <laughs> All right, Karen. Tell me everything you enjoyed about this film from 1980, chosen for us. By Tanya. It's pretty intense. It's very slow build, but it gets, I thought it got really interesting at the end. It was 
different to see George C. I think I've only seen George C. Scott very old. Like with the well, he's full, not young in this. No, he's not young, but he's not old. Like he doesn't have full white hair and all of that. He's middle aged, basically, which I've I never suppose. seen him before. <laughs> well, he was an interesting choice, I'll say that, because he's not what you'd call handsome, but he's a good actor. There's some things I have some issues with a little bit, but he carries the film very well. I like the story. Well, I didn't like the story, <laughs> but it was an interesting story. And I have some questions about it because I'm not sure I caught everything I was supposed to. I'm guessing there's symbolism of water in this somehow. Um, there's a lot of water stuff in it. There's a small cast, very easy to follow who's who. It's creepy. Like I felt I was alone watching it. And it, I was a little creeped out. Something banged on the door and I jumped. <laughs> so obviously I was into it. The music's good. I like the music. It added a lot. The house is incredible. I'd love to live there if the murdered young boy wasn't there. <laughs> what about you? Did you like it? It was all right. It's beautiful. It's beautifully shot, I think. Yeah, there's really good camera angles. Lots of, there was some points where there were silhouettes that really worked well. There are some really nice shots, especially some long single take shots, you know, when we're panning around the house and things like that. A lot of that stuff makes it slow too. So <laughs> a, a good acting. I thought the effects were good too. What effects there were once, once the effects came in, they were good. <laughs> I did the music added a lot, of course, because he's a composer. It was interesting how they used music to link scenes and things like that as well. Yeah, the music box, there's a music box scene, which if you listen, we'll get to. But to have it play what he was composing without ever having heard it was, I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. I thought, like I said, the acting was good. I thought the lady who played Claire was really good. You liked how she looked? Is that what you're saying? No, I said she's really good. She was she, good. She was a good actor. And of course, George T. Scott too. But and it is a small cast, but you wouldn't know it by reading the list of characters I have written down on my pad of paper here that I always list the characters. And I stopped. There's only really four main characters, I think. Yeah, four or five, maybe yeah. five. Yeah. There is sequel potential. There is, which I enjoyed. Not quite sure how they'd do it, but they could. Well, yeah, it's a ghost. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. <laughs> All right. Is that it? Yeah, it's beautiful. Like you said, it's very cerebral. Like it's, there's not a ton of action in it, but there's a ton of, wow, if I was in that situation, that would be scary. It's intensely emotional and cerebral. Like you're thinking about it the whole time. Okay, anything you didn't like? I didn't think that George C. Scott and the Claire woman had any chemistry at all. They're supposed to have sort of a love well, connection. Do they? I don't know, because they, they kind of like inter make you think that's going to happen and inner, you know, when she's looking at him at the symphony or whatever, but nothing ever comes of it. So not really. Well, it's a little soon in his life after the tragedy, but I didn't feel any chemistry there at all. It cuts sometimes in weird places, like there'll be something very intense where he's had like a, a very shocking kind of experience in the house and then bam, it's morning and he's going about his business like he wasn't even affected by whatever it was. And that happens two or three times where I'm thinking I would not be staying in the house or, you know, like, and he just kind of goes, ho-hum, I guess there's a ghost in the house. Let's go on, you know, to do whatever I need to do. Yeah, he buys the whole thing from the very beginning. He's he's all in. Yeah, but he doesn't have like any type of terror or fear or I don't know. It It just cuts to the next day and he's just going off to investigate. There's no fear. You're right. I guess he just doesn't just buys into it and says- well, he this, like he says at one point, this, 
whatever's there is desperately trying to communicate. Right. And he accepts it. So he's it, a believer. So he tries to help however he can. It's a little long. There are some things that definitely could have been cut that didn't need to be there that I guess were a little personal development or something, character development and things. I was a little confused at the end, not to give spoilers or whatever, but I'm not sure I can say it with, I can say it without spoilers, it, sort of, but does the guy know what happened? No. Okay. Cause I couldn't figure out if he, cause they kind of implied that he did, but I don't think I couldn't figure out if he did. And it's a completely different reaction as especially as the viewer, if he did know or if he didn't know. And I'm not sure why, I guess it took this long because the ghost finally found someone to communicate with and let the story be told. Because it seemed like a long time to wait to expose everything. True. But you always got to follow the money. You know, that's, they say that and it's the truth. Is there anything you didn't like? It's too long. And I felt like it lost its way. Like it stopped being a horror film. You know, I'm not sure this is a horror film, really. Well, there's ghosts. Yeah, I know. But still, it turns into like a, a mystery. Almost like a whodunit. But it's a horror mystery. I guess. It finds I mean, its way in Scooby the Scooby-Doo and the, part the gang of the films... are coming in and ripping the, the mask off. It's, it's actually a ghost. Yeah seeking revenge because there's deaths yes i think it's definitely a horror film i think it's just a thriller and i was going to say the best part of the film is the last 20 minutes yeah i was going to say the last half hour it really gets good well that was my my first time check when i it's not the first one i did but when i actually said it in my notes that there are 20 minutes left and that's that's when it picked up tremendously I wonder if it's a different time and or if we've watched so many of these. It's like when I'm watching it, I think, okay, there's a ghost in the house. <laughs> like I didn't need them to prove it to me. And they proved it over and over and over. You know, like there are very intense moments with the ball and the, you know, like different things happening and they're trying to figure out who it is. Um, the scene with the medium was pretty cool. I did like that too, but I, I do don't remember know. Tanya saying that in her email that that was a important scene or but I don't know like I said if we're just horror people where you don't have to convince me I get it there's a scary ghost in there that wants revenge I would get that with one scene possibly two I didn't need a whole bunch of them I didn't need and it's a build you know it's I think when you know it's already there but they're building it for you they're giving you clues. Like I said, right. it's a mystery. It is, but it has horror. And the whole beginning with his wife and daughter and all that stuff, I'm not even sure we needed any of that, to be honest. No, the only thing that kind of connected with that was he said something about his daughter being about the same age. And so he was thinking that he almost was thinking that they were trying to communicate to him through whoever this other entity was or something. There was some little moment like that where he was open because he thought it was Well, he's his... wondering why this thing is speaking to him, and he wonders if it's because he lost his daughter, who was about the same age. Right. Something. There's a connection. And she died in a vehicle accident, and so did the uh, ghost. What? No. They thought that at first. That's, but... that's true. That is yeah. true. So again, I'm not sure we needed that whole thing either. No, there's a where lot. Where they lead us down one way and it's like, oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, it has nothing to do with that at all. So yeah, I think it's it's a whodunit. You're right. That's all I got. I liked it overall. It was fine. It was long. I don't like it better it. if it was like a half hour shorter. <laughs> with some nudity. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to make it that long, Greg needs some nudity. <laughs> I mean, there was lots of times where there was nothing happening. Even you could leave and leave in those shots. I was talking about those one take shots of moving around and showing us the house. You could have left those 
few things in and done away with all the other things where he's everybody's walking up and down stairs and looking in rooms and <laughs> all this or stuff. That but, part's okay, but like the horseback riding that he and Claire do, the time yeah. that he spends at the university, the walking up to the university building, yeah. the walking away from the university building, going to the symphony. Yes. Like there's a lot of things where if it had just focused on the house. Lots of walking and lots of traveling. Um, here I there. think it would have been better. Yes. Because you would have been just confined to the house, which I don't know if that house is real, but it's huge. When he's going to rent the house and they drive up to it. I was like, Oh my God. It's gotta be real. Doesn't it? I don't know. But I mean, they, it was a rich family who lived there obviously. So, you know, it has to be ornate and opulent, but I don't know. One person in a house like that would be scary <laughs> without anything in it. Yeah. I don't know if I say it in my notes, but when he drove up to the, when they drove up to that house and he was going to rent it, I was like, why does this single dude need a house <laughs> this big? I would always be wondering if someone was in the other part of the house. I mean, they gave him a, a you know, a handyman, thank God to take care of it <laughs> and, a, and a maid. Otherwise he would have no chance of keeping that house up. No. And it needed work anyway. Oh shit, Karen. The house seen in the film in real life doesn't and never actually did exist. Wow. Filmmakers could not find a suitable mansion to use for the film. So at a cost of around $200,000, they had a facade attached to the front of a much more modern dwelling. That's crazy. I mean, I like the house, but I could have lived there with my entire extended family. Hell yeah. And probably never seen them. There were three floors of full. I, I love those Gothic houses though, but they, you know, with the wood and they're just beautiful. Those old Victorian houses. All right. Anything else? No, I don't think so. All right. What kind of cocktail rating do you want to give this film, Karen, that Anya so graciously selected for us? I think it's a three. I guess. It's a three. I mean, it's... It's a different kind of horror film, though. You have to be ready for a thinker and um, a thriller and a whodunit. Yeah. A, a mystery. mystery. All right. We'll give it a three. That means I mean, it took us three cocktails to get through it, boys and girls. I could have had four, but I, I wanted to pace myself. <laughs> All right. Before we get into it scene by scene, Karen, would you like to hear a review? From the time. Of course. First, I have to tell you, <laughs> this has a 7.1 out of 10 on IMDb, an 85% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. What do you think Google users think of this film? 92. 88, Karen. Oh. 88. You were a little high, a little high. The film review I have is from the Boston Phoenix. Ooh, that's new. I know. That's why I picked it. From April 22nd, 1980. And I'm going to read most of it. I will paraphrase as I go. For at least a third of its length, the changeling is quietly unnerving, terrifying in a way that goes against the grain of most contemporary spook shows. Although the plot involves ghostly happenings in a creepy old house, it is no Amityville horror. And if the terrors are supernatural, they are hardly satanic in the manner of the exorcist. Instead of using the usual manipulations and gratuitous gore, the changeling chills us to the marrow with a nightmarish ambiguity. Are the weird manifestations actually happening or merely the demons of a tortured mind? I guess you could have looked at it like that. <laughs> I never did. <laughs> I didn't either. This is Roman Polanski, Val Luton country, a paranoid, fevered world in which horrors spring from human complexities from within rather than without. Even before we get to that gorgeous, rotting old Seattle mansion, a demon's dream house, the seeds of an internalized menace are planted. Following the accidental deaths of his wife and child, 
pianist teacher George C. Scott begins seeing things. As he packs to move from the family apartment, his loved ones suddenly materialize only to disappear a second later. At this point, there are no intimations of the supernatural. Clearly, Scott's grief-stricken mind is doing the conjuring. I didn't see that at all. I thought they were just memories. I didn't think it was. Yeah, I agree. Memories. Looked like flashbacks to me. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, memories. When he moves to the mansion, however, and the walls start pounding and the chandelier begins tinkling and the apparitions turn up in the bathtub, we share in Scott's wonderment and terror and above all, his uncertainty. Indeed, the circumstances are so intriguing that we feel as if we're experiencing these hoary scare tactics for the first time. It does take a while to get used to seeing Scott in such gothic surroundings. You'd figure that one good bellow from his raging bull would turn the most fearsome phantom into jelly. As it turns out, Scott's force has been toned down to a whimper, and the contrast between his massive body and his restrained demeanor is striking. He's a haunted American hunk, alone and afraid, much like the Burt Lancaster and Robert Mitchum, Mitchum of the 40s film noir. An empty shell with enough room inside to fit us all. But soon after, director Peter Medic chucks it all and decides to make precise what he has previously left ambiguous. When Scott leaves his piano to investigate the unearthly pounding, the camera moves in for a close-up of the piano keys. All of a sudden, a lone key presses down by itself. That's not when that happens. But At last, we know for sure what Scott is still fumbling to confirm. The joint really is haunted. When the truth finally dawns on him in an admittedly hair-raising scene, the film quickly descends into chiller routine. Scott gets a new grip on his sanity. And See, that's new... when we started to like it. <laughs> no, this is, when it, this is when it lost its way. It started to turn into a mystery, and he's all of a sudden a detective. But anyway, Scott gets a new grip on his sanity and a new female companion to boot. And the two set out to help the ghost of the house, a murdered boy, in his vengeful search for eternal peace. The supernatural sleuthing leads to a crusty old senator whose shady past is somehow linked to the death of the boy. The changeling turns out to be nothing more than the tale of a muckraking spirit, a sort of occult, all the president's men. And the opening portion has been but a tantalizing teaser. The writers should have been shrewd enough to know that their ghost story would have been more terrifying without a concrete explanation. Even the political corruption angle would have been benefited by ambiguity. But the filmmakers have obviously failed to perceive that in literalizing the ghostly phenomena, they relieve their audience of its nameless horror and is it horror when it's all said and done exactly what this tale is intended to inspire? I agree with most of that. That's why you read them. I think you find ones that agree with you and read them. No, I don't. I hadn't. I didn't read this. I already had it printed and everything. I didn't read it until I finished watching the film. Just I just skimmed it then. So, all right. Are you ready to get into the film scene by scene, Karen? Yeah, but I have a couple of things to say right before we start. So first of all, there's a little background, and I didn't check this, but this was on the internet, so it must be true. <laughs> the screenplay was written by Russell Hunter, who claimed to have experienced the events while living in the Henry Treat Rogers Mansion in Denver, Colorado. Hmm. And then we've talked a little bit about this. I think one of the movies we watched had a changeling in it. But in European folklore, what a changeling is, is a deformed or imbecilic offspring of fairy or elves substituted by them for a human infant. So they take a, they replace a human infant with a changeling who is deformed or something. The abducted human children are given to the devil or used to strengthen the fairy stock. Unfortunately, according to this folklore, the return of the original child may be affected by making the changeling laugh or torturing it. 
And this later belief was responsible for numerous cases of actual child abuse. So someone who has a child who starts out appearing what we would call normal, but has changes a little bit later, a lot of folklore says they have a changeling, which is fairies or elves came in with a defective, what they would call a defective child and take the normal, again, air quotes from the crib and change them out. Because I couldn't figure out why this was called the changeling. I couldn't either. But the child was deformed or at least sickly, weak and sickly. And then he brought in a normal one. So he's like the elves or the fairy, you know, changed out the children. Okay. You ready to get into it? Yes. The Changeling from 1980, rated R. Did you watch this on Amazon Prime, Ken? I did. There were warnings too. I did not. Oh, where did you watch it, it? I watched it on YouTube. Nice. Did you pay for it, Karen? Yep, two ninety nine. Right. Smoking, violence, frightening scenes, foul language. Film starts. We have credits, and we have words to read. Upstate New York, November twenty seventh, and we see George C. Scott and his family pushing a station wagon in the snow. Apparently, engine problems or something, and he goes to a phone booth to call for help. They're in, they're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I guess that's how it was. They are at an entrance of a park or something, because there's a sign. There is a sign, something right. park, but But still, it's like, just it's not in a parking lot. It's just on the side of a road. Right, the phone And I'm booth. sure it was there, but it just, there's a couple of things in this story that are very 80s that kind of made me laugh. And one of those is a phone booth just in the middle of nowhere, just because <laughs> there it is. And the next thing I wrote is it looks like an accident's going to happen because we get two cars coming at each other, a truck and a car, a big a truck going road. way too fast in a car. And the mom and the daughter are having a snowball fight and you hear them laughing. They're a very happy little family. They're, <laughs> I would not be pushing the car <laughs> joking with my husband about ha 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 this is so fun you know next time let's go to hawaii <laughs> i'd be like god damn it i have to push a car and it's freezing outside and so he watches from the phone booth as his wife and child are run over by a truck into the snow bank yes. hence the drink the snow drift and then we have more credits Next, we have George C. Scott walking through the city with a attache case or something. Yes, in the rain. He arrives at home. Everything is boxed up. Then we have a flashback of him playing the piano and his daughter bounces a ball to him. And as that happens, a ball bounces out of one of the boxes that the maid has just brought in. Then we have more words to read. Seattle, March 4th. So it's been about four months. He can't stay in the Five apartment. Months, whatever. No, it's the end of November when it happens. That's true. So he doesn't want to stay in the apartment that he had with his family. So he's moved out to, from New York, I guess, to Seattle. So then from here on out, I call him John. George, she's got his Yes, I call him John, John, too. So then we see John smoking a Marlboro and he's talking to another couple about his He's experience. actually smoking, though. Wait, he's actually smoking Lucky Strikes. Is he? Did, did you see the packet? That's what my grandpa. Uh, I didn't make any. I didn't. Notice, There's a packet at one point. Lots of not lots of film cigarettes resemble Lucky Strike packs. Oh, they do. Yeah. Well, it just looked like the pack that my grandfather used to have because he smoked unfiltered Lucky Strikes. He's smoking filters, so. But so that's like a generic thing they do in film. Yeah, they kind of. Okay. Looks like he's smoking Winston's, but I don't know for sure. I'm sure he smoked his regular brand during filming. <laughs> I bet he did because he smokes a lot. <laughs> and he's talking to another couple about his experience after his wife and daughter died. And you know, they seem like they're friends. Yeah. Yeah. And then we learned they that said they said, you can stay here. There's plenty of room. And he says, no, he wants to rent a house. We learned that John is a composer and he's going to teach at a university. And he's looking for a house to rent, as you just said. Then John meets Claire, 
we learn at the house or at a house. Again, he's staying outside the gate, smoking a Marlboro, waiting for her to arrive. Yeah, I thought she was the realtor, but she's just the historical society person. Right. John gets in her car and they drive up to the house. It's huge. I mean, there is no other way to describe it, but huge. It's monstrous. And like, we what learn... is he doing? Like, why? <laughs> there's, there's not some little nice, you know, cottage or something he could be in. I know he needs a piano, but still, it's crazy. And we learn the house has been empty for 12 years and it is now owned by the Historical Society. But she's only been with the society for a year, so she doesn't know why it hasn't been. He because he asks later, probably I think, but she hasn't been with the historical society long enough to know why no one's been in it. And she shows him the music room. It's partially furnished. There's a couple of things that have been left there, including and, a piano. And right here, I wrote there's a nice shot panning through the house, a single shot. And there's a knock at the doors. John is playing the piano, and one of the keys of the piano is not working, it appears. He gets up to go to the door, and the note plays by itself. Yeah, and we meet Mr. Tuttle. Who's so we know man. pretty much immediately. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are believers, yes, that we know yeah, this watching real. this movie. But Mr. Tuttle's the handyman. He's there, and you also see a maid. So I think John has a little money, too. Because oh, yeah. he's driving a They're... pretty nice car. and Yeah, Symphony's playing his music. <laughs> then we see John at the university giving his first lecture. Well, first we see him walking through the university. Yes. <laughs> then he gives his first lecture. And apparently there's a lot more students there than have enrolled in the class. I think he's famous. Yeah. Somehow. Then he begins his playing then we cut to a symphony performance, and apparently they're playing the same composition that he started playing. Then at the symphony, I guess Senator Carmichael gives a speech, and he's trying to raise money for the symphony. And he's on the board of the Historical Society. Claire isn't impressed, and they go get a drink. And I wrote, love connection, question mark. I wrote, John and Claire share some champagne and do some small talk. <laughs> But yeah, she looks at him like you're thinking, all right. Next, there's a fairly long shot I wrote of John arriving home that evening. Again, uh, evening again, him driving up and walking in and walking through the house. Well, that's interesting, too. And there's a couple of things like he goes, it's got a one car garage. Yes. Yeah. Monstrous house. Yeah. That, yeah. It starts. He pulls up, pulls in the garage and he pauses in the garage to seem to soak in the scene, the room and. And, and then he, he had to close the door. So these are, it's this two is doors. The, it's like a stable door. And yeah. He's got to close, close them himself. This is the cusp of things changing. Like when he arrives in Seattle, he gets his suitcase. That was back when suitcases didn't have wheels and you had to freaking lug your suitcase, you know, through the airport. And his looks leather or something. It, so you, it, and then here he pulls into the garage and there's no automatic door. It's not, you got to close it like a stable, like you said. And it's a one, that I thought was funny. It's a one car garage, but it's going to rain. It's thundering. What's well, Seattle? Next morning, banging in the house wakes him up. Cut to John composing. At 6 a.m. Yeah. It sounds like a big bass drum. What do you think they made? Was it a timpani? What kind of, what were they using to it make that metallic noise? sounded metallic to me. Metallic to me. Oh, so like one of those... I don't know. That they make thunder and lightning with. Maybe. I don't know what they used. And as but, John is composing, a door opens behind him. But the pounding is very, very loud. And he just yeah. goes, huh, there's pounding in the house. Then goes yeah, down I, and composes. I immediately, I immediately thought it was like a boiler or Maybe something. I guess that's what he thought it was. Like that. And then we John learns that no one else is in the house because Tuttle comes... From a room. different door, yeah. John smokes a Marlboro and continues composing. He presses record on the reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Then the music plays and plays and plays, and the music is still playing, and we see John reading a book, but apparently he's listening to the recording. So that's why I say it. it like goes from music transitions us from one scene to another. Yeah, it's much later in the day, I think. 
Yeah. Claire arrives with paintings from the house and a photograph of the. Yeah. I thought that was going to be more significant later, but nothing came of that. It's just a reason for her to show up, I guess. Hello, boys and girls. Karen and I hope you are enjoying the podcast. You know what I think can make your listening experience even better? A delicious themed adult beverage. You can find all our drink recipes on our website, scaryspirits.com, in the recipe den. Tune in every Wednesday and join us for a drink. Now, back to the show. And then Claire opens his desk and finds the ball in there, his daughter's ball that he brought with him, put in the desk and brought with him. And I kept thinking, she looks like she's going to go horseback riding. <laughs> That's what, yes, yeah, she does. She's Those got the boots. Groovy boots. The boots and the riding pants. And he asks, are you going to horseback riding? And she says, yes, do you ride? And so then they go horseback riding together. But she's in the full outfit, the boots, the riding pants, the blazer jacket and the like bowler. What do they call that hat? The I don't know. Bowler hat or what a bowler hat or something. And he's in jeans and a flannel shirt. <laughs> it's funny. I just thought it was funny. She's got all the accoutrements and he just goes, okay, I'll get on the horse. And at and one no- point they stop and he says he was thinking about his daughter and how she likes horses or something. But we don't know where the horses came from or anything. The nope. house itself that he's in is pretty much in the middle of nowhere from the long shots we saw. There's no neighbors or anything. And then we have a flashback to the accident. And John wakes up crying, I guess, and banging sound in the house again at 6 At 6 o'clock. Yeah. So I think he was dreaming about I'm the sure. accident. Then we see John and Tuttle, the handyman, looking for the cause of the banging. And John tells us that it happens every morning at 6 a.m. And it's very rhythmic, precise. And Tuttle says it's the furnace. <laughs> it's an it old house. It has a mind of its own. It makes noise. It's an old house, he says. So then John is rehearsing with a string quartet. Students, then, I think. Then after they leave, he finds the water running in the kitchen. And he hears other sounds in the house and goes to investigate. It sounds have, like they're turning on a shower or something, definitely, or I don't know. And we have the sound of water running again, and he goes upstairs and finds the water running in a bathtub. He yeah, turns he's not, it up off. on the third floor, so he goes all the way up there. He turns it off and sees a face under the water, an apparition or some shit. Next day, he goes to the Historical Society. He talks to Claire about what has been happening in the house as he smokes a Marlboro out on the balcony. That was a cool little balcony, little garden area up there. Yeah. But see, he just saw a face in a bathtub and then they cut to next day at the historical society. Like he just went to, he's like, okay, there was face in the bathtub. Going he's already all in. He's already wanting to know what happened. That would have freaked me out. (laughs) Uh, Then Claire takes a call from her mother And another lady who we learn is Minnie at the Historical Society tells John that there was an issue with his lease. It should not have been rented to him. And she says that house should not be lived in. It doesn't want people. She's a Karen. (laughs) (laughs) She's upset. But you don't know it. You kind of don't know exactly why she's just she's just angry and doesn't want him to be in the house because there were shortcuts made to get him in there. So at this point you think she could just be a rule follower. Yeah. And wants everything done properly. And like things... me, like me. Yes, Karen. exactly. <laughs> You're more of a Karen than I am. <laughs> All right, Karen. <laughs> then we see John at the house and he walks outside and a glass shatters. I From took that window. a window shatters and it was colored glass. So I think it, it was, was stained. Red. Yeah, it was stained glass, right? Mm-hmm. So stained glass windows have been used for thousands of years, Greg. Their history can be traced back to ancient Rome and Egypt. The Romans, they think, were the first to use glass to use glass in windows, and Egyptians and Arab architects also created stained glass objects. They were a prominent feature of churches, cathedrals, city halls, and homes in Europe between 1150 and 1550. 
That's when the art of stained glass reached its height. So most of them were in churches. Once it became more affordable for the common person, non-religious stained glass panels began to appear in homes. They still leaded glass, a technique that originated in France is still used today. The basic materials for making the glass are sand and wood ash. And to color the glass, powdered metals are added to the mixture while it is still molten. So mostly stained glass were used to bring bright light into dark churches and tell a story. So I wrote a window in the attic, question mark. It just like explodes from above him and falls at his feet. So then John goes up to investigate. And I'm just going to read what I wrote. He finds a closet with a boarded up window. No, it's a door. <laughs> <laughs> He removes the boards and begins hammering on the lock, padlock. That's yes, all. and he An old padlock a, removes it with gusto. He wants to know what's behind yeah, it. He's he takes very his, his ball peen hammer and hammers away at it. And then the yes. banging noise occurs again in the house to the same rhythm as him hammering that lock. So he figures he's on the right track. He breaks the lock. Then he tries to bust through the door and it opens on its own. Yeah. Gives a few pushes. Like there's some piece of heavy furniture behind it. And then when he steps back, it just opens on its own. Like you said, behind the door is a set of stairs leading up to the attic. I guess he goes upstairs and finds a room filled with cobwebs and dust. Karen. Yes. No one's been in there for a while. And I wrote, it must be a child's room because everything looks small. There's a, Small wheelchair and a small roll top desk in there. And he finds, I called it a composition book, but it's like a notebook, right? Or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Dated 1909. And there's initials on it, but I didn't get it at this point. But apparently it is CSB, right? Mm hmm Then he sees a music box sitting on the mantle of the fireplace in the room. He opens the music box and it plays the same melody as the music that John is composing. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Then Claire comes over. John shows her the room. And the book has the initial CSB, like I said. And after they leave, the wheelchair moves. Question mark? I don't know, something happens with the wheelchair. It makes a sound. I just said something's happening. To, I don't know. Something with the move wheelchair. very much. Yeah. And he does explain that it's the same melody to Claire, but he says he's never heard that music before or whatever. Then we see John at the Historical Society looking up history of the house. Minnie tells him the house uh, was owned by a Dr. Carmichael. He had a family tragedy and sold the house. No, it was not Carmichael. That's who the Carmichaels bought it from. Oh, okay. There was someone else, Dr. It wasn't Baylor, but it was something like that. Got it. So the Carmichael's bought it from the doctor. Yes. So then we see John and Claire, I guess, at the library looking at newspaper from 1909 on microfilm. Yeah. Microfilm, <laughs> which I've actually done. I have too, Karen. So <laughs> microfilm, <laughs> microfilm, a method for preserving and storing large amounts of print material, such as newspapers in a small space. Each page of a newspaper is copied and shrunk down to a tiny image, which is then printed on a reel of film. Microfilm is compact and lightweight and can reduce storage space requirements by up to 95% compared to filing paper. It also protects rare, fragile, or valuable items from theft or damage. So all of this was before internet and computers. It was just a way to research things. The National Archives and Records Administration says that a roll of microfilm has an expected lifespan of around 500 years. Hmm. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that, but the microfilming process, especially as much as it gets used or as much as it used to get used yes. anyway. <laughs> well, now it's, it'll probably be fine. The microfilming process was standardized and patented in 1859 by French optician René Dagron. The Grand, maybe. Mm -hmm. This was interesting. One of the first practical uses of microphotography involved carrier pigeons. In the 1870s, during the Franco-Prussian War, De Grand created the microphotographs of official documents and private messages and sent them across enemy lines to Paris in small tubes affixed to a pigeon's wing. But then 
they figured out what was the was going on. The Prussians caught on and sent out falcons and hawks to intercept the pigeons. <laughs> but that was I thought that was pretty cool. But um they created prints so small that a single pigeon could carry 20 of them at a time. The old microfiche machine. So they read about the accident. Uh, the girl- what happens is they at the historical society, they couldn't have any, they couldn't find anything before 1920. Right. So they want to know who lived in the house and it was a doctor with two They had kids. to rely on many. Yes. A son and a daughter. <laughs> And they had some kind of family tragedy and sold the house. So they want to find out what the tragedy was. And they're, so they're looking at the microfilm. So apparently the doctor's daughter was hit by a coal car. Cart. Cart. <laughs> yes. Whatever. And the child has the same initials as is on the book in the attic room. Yes. Yeah, so they think they're on to something. Then they find the obituary for the little girl. They go to the cemetery and look at the family plot. And the little There's girl... There's some good scenes. There's some good shots there looking up at them. The little girl was killed in a very similar way as John's daughter. Claire wants him to get out of the house. She's concerned. And we see John at the house looking at a photo album of his wife and daughter. And his daughter's ball comes bouncing down the stairs. John drives to a bridge and drops the ball into the water. See, there's a lot of water, a lot of water symbolism, I think, in this film. He arrives back at the house and the ball bounces down the stairs to him. So it seems the ghost can leave the house. Then we see John at the university and he's at the psychic research department, Karen. Yes, which every university has. I know. (laughs) I, I, I thought that... That psychic department sign looks very fresh. (laughs) (laughs) Every university I've ever been at has the psychic research department. But uh, that would be the most fun department. Let's go down to the psychic research department, see what they're up to. I guess the professor there, I guess he's a professor or a doc. uh, I don't know what he is, but (laughs) I guess he suggests a psychic medium or something. Yeah, he admits, he says 99% of them that come in, they're frauds. But that 1%, you'll get someone who really knows what's going on. And he must have given John a name because next, the medium arrives at the house. And I guess they're going to have a seance. That's what I thought. But they, they don't really have a seance so much as she just kind of reads the house. And the medium heads upstairs. She finds the stairway to the room. Immediately, she's like drawn to it. Cut to the seance, and the medium does psychic writing. Yeah. And we learn the spirit is not the child who they read about in the paper. So all that was for nothing. Yes. (laughs) A wild goose chase. Spirit says its name is Joseph, and the spirit asks John for help. So what's happening is the... Medium is sitting at the table. She's got a stack of papers and a pencil, and she's scribbling as she's asking these questions. And she's kind of in a trance, I would say, a little bit. And her husband pulls the paper. When she's filled a piece of paper with scribbles, he pulls it away. And then when she asks questions, sometimes her hand will write yes or no, or the name of the child was Joseph. So she's writing these things around or continuously while she's scribbling. So every once in a while, she'll hear something and write it out. I thought it was pretty intense scene, really. The medium asks the spirit to speak to John because we cut to another thing now. They're still there sitting at the table, but now there's like a large metal funnel sitting on the table. Yeah, but it's like they're using like a Ouija board, but it's scribbles, you know? And then they, I don't know what the cone was. It just all of a sudden appeared. Uh, it's a long metal, it looks like a modern, sometimes they sell those modern Christmas trees, you know, like that's what it looks like. You used the C word, Karen. Sorry. Holiday it, tree. <laughs> it, it, it begins to move. The big funnel begins to move. Mm-hmm. And then a glass flies across the room, smashes into a cabinet, and the door to the attic shuts. Slams shut, Yeah. Later that night, John smokes a Marlboro and listens to the recording he made of the seance. 
Claire freaked out too when the glass was thrown. She was crying. But then he just shoes everyone out and he's fine. He's going to just yep. listen to the recording now. And during the recording, he hears the voice of the spirit. Yeah. And he has to rewind it about 25 times to <laughs> yes, make sure. He does. <laughs> yeah, he does. But it's creepy. And but I have... don't know why he didn't just set up the recorder later because he screams in the house, what do you want me to do? And I'm thinking, he talked. You could hear it on the recording. Just start the tape recorder, talk, and see if you can get him to talk back to you. Like, I was very frustrated he didn't try that. You were frustrated that he didn't do an EVP session, Karen? <laughs> well, but just he, <laughs> he had proof that, I mean, possibly the child could only talk because of the medium being there. But still. Uh, then we have a flashback of Joseph's father drowning him in a tub. Yeah, that was awful. And the banging on the metal tub in rhythm with banging in the house. That's Yes, as he's drowning, he's banging on the side of the tub. Then John, I guess, is taking notes as he's listening, because I think he hears more than what the psychic heard. Yes, that's why I thought he should use that later. Because he's written down Carmichael. He's got the last name. <laughs> Ranch, well, my father, my body. And metal written down. Yeah, I like, think it's his, what he did. I don't know. My metal, he kept saying. And I couldn't understand the spirit voice a lot. No, oh, because like, it was. What the hell is it saying? So then John calls Claire and asks her to come back and he collapses. But did yeah. it sound like to you he was using a rotary phone? Did it do the da 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 Push no. button phone. <laughs> There's a couple things like that in this film I noticed. So anyway, he collapses. So then we see. So I guess back at the house, Claire's there and she's listening to the tape and she cries. Yeah, she's getting upset. And then they say something about Sacred Heart Orphanage, which I didn't know where they got Sacred Heart from. That's he wrote it on the paper, so he heard it on the tape. Okay. We didn't, but he did. How convenient. So then Claire becomes hysterical and she sees the wheelchair at the top of the stairs. So then we see John spying on Senator Carmichael. Watching yeah, so, so again, it's another <laughs> cut. So she's hysterical. The wheelchair's at the top of the stairs. Cut. He's watching the, the Senator Carmichael. You're like, okay, but was it, something else must have happened between then and now. And Senator Carmichael is entering Spencer Carmichael Tower. And it's a tall, it's an interesting building, for one thing. It's skinnier at the bottom than it is at the top. And later we see Senator right, well, right this next scene. We see the Senator in his office, and he's it's way up there because it is above the space needle. Yes, you can see the space needle. <laughs> and did you know the space needle in Seattle, Washington has a rich history? that began with a napkin sketch in 1959 and culminated in the opening of the iconic structure in 1962. The Space Needle's origins date back to 1959 when Edward Carlson, a hotel executive and organizer of the 1962 World's Fair, sketched his vision for the structure on a napkin in Germany. Carlson was inspired by a broadcast tower he saw there. The Space Needle's final design was created by architect John Graham Jr., who wanted the top to resemble a UFO. The structure's design went through many changes, including concept for a tethered balloon and a cocktail shaker. So it opened on April 21st, 1962, the first day of the World's Fair. The structure was completed in less than a year and cost $4.5 to build. So then we cut to Minnie from the Historical Society calling Senator Carmichael. She tells she's a him, tattletale. Yeah, she she's a mole. Him, <laughs> tells him that John and Claire have been going through the files, and Senator Carmichael seems concerned, which makes you think that he. Yeah, I thought that's why he might but, know, but I don't think he does. But I don't think he did. When I got to the end, I didn't think he did. But there, yeah. I thought he did. But maybe he's just—he's a senator and so used to being blackmailed or whatever True. that he just figured somebody looking in the past was trouble. So then uh, we see John and Claire, I guess, meeting at a restaurant, and they go over all the evidence they've discovered. Yes, and he says, I found some things, I think he says at the library, and I had them Xeroxed. 
<laughs> yes, he does. So we used to use that term. We Xeroxed things. That was the new term for photocopying. Yes. Well, the old now it's the old. In 1938, <laughs> Chester Carlson, a physicist working independently, invented a process for printing images using an electronically charged photoconductor coated metal plate and dry powdered toner. It would take more than 20 years of refinement before the first automated machine to make copies was commercialized using a document feeder, scanning light, and a rotating drum. I guess they've discovered that Joseph was secretly buried and they've got an or orphan to take his place. Uh, well, they're figuring it out. That they this went must overseas be and did not come back until the child was 18. And that child is now Senator Carmichael. Yeah, John, and no one would question it because if he wasn't crippled anymore, they'd say he was cured. I don't know if the father ever came back, but the child definitely said he did. did. Okay. Yeah, because they said he didn't set foot back on American soil until the child was 18 or whatever. Oh. So then John is going to continue his investigation to see if there was a ranch with a well, because those were two more words. I think he's getting a lot of his information from the tape that he listened to. And then we see John looking at atlases. Yes, another thing that doesn't exist anymore that we used to look at. That was I always enjoyed looking at an We're atlas. Just basically going through building plans and stuff. Well, no, property ownership, property plans, maps yeah. of property ownership going back, you know, a century or whatever. And they see how the Carmichael property. But these, uh, wait, the books are freaking huge. They are like, huge. Those are the old atlas that we used to look at. Considering how horrible I am at geography, you'd be shocked to know I used to like to look at atlases like that. <laughs> but they're huge. But they're going through the years, and it's probably the curator at the museum saying, okay, in this, I think they started in 1914 or something. I don't know. They So there's a well... And then in the next atlas, there's a well, which is later. And then a little later, there's no well, and they've just subdivided. They've sold off the property. Yeah, so it's now like houses. And there's a house, up. yeah. So then John goes to the house where the located where the well was. There's no answer at the door, but he finds a package on the porch and <laughs> sees that it is the, going to someone named Mrs. E. Gray or something. Yeah, I don't know why that needed to be there either. Don't but know. I guess to get her name so he could call yeah. her. I guess. Now he has her name and address so he can look her up in the phone book, Karen. So then we see John and Claire driving. They again discuss what's going on. Joseph's father was never going to get any of the money, but he was to be the guardian of the son so he could kind of control the son. Uh, but if the child died and did not reach the age of 21 the inheritance would have gone to charity yeah so the man who has the money had a daughter the daughter married a man that the father didn't like she died i think in childbirth doesn't doesn't it say she died early she's not around so he doesn't like the son-in-law but they had a son his daughter and the, the son-in-law that he doesn't like the grandchild is a son. So he leaves in the will everything. I mean, and this guy is mega, mega rich. Everything goes to the grandson. The father can only control it because he's trustee or whatever. But the son has to make it to age 21. Unfortunately, the son is not in good health. He's got arthritis and is weak and just not, not a healthy kid. So the dad of the not healthy kid thinks he's not going to make it till 21. We're not going to get any of this money. So he does nefarious things. So then John and Clara go to see Mrs. Gray. And Mrs. Gray tells them that her daughter had a nightmare the same night as the seance. Her daughter said that she had seen a boy very small and frail trying to come up from the floor. John wants to tear the little girl's room apart. He wants to just... <laughs> Cut out the floor and go dig for a well. <laughs> Mrs. Gray says, I'll have to think about it. Call you later. Then we see Mrs. Gray's daughter get up in the middle of the night and she goes to her room because she's sleeping with mom now. And she sees a boy in water under her floor. 
and screams. Next, we cut to John and uh, Mrs. Gray's son, I guess, taking a chainsaw to the floor of the room. <laughs> and then Claire taking arrives. it out one bucket at a time. <laughs> I was like, like that he would pass down the bucket and then they would lift up the bucket. It was kind of funny. Yeah, they That's find a well forever. under the floor. Yeah. John goes down into the well and begins digging five gallon buckets by five gallon buckets. And he finds a human skeleton. Mrs. Gray calls the police. Police arrive and take the bones. John tells them he has no idea who the boy might be, but I don't think they believe him. Well, no. <laughs> why did they just let him? Why? It makes no sense. He knows something. He knew to dig, dig right there. By not saying he didn't know anything, it's almost like he's guilty of something. Later that night, John returns to the house and breaks in. To the house with Mrs. the well Gray's in it. House. Yeah. yeah. And he goes back to the well and begins digging. And then a chain comes up out of the ground, Karen. A chain with a metal. Yes. And John picks it up. He takes the metal to Claire's house to show her. <laughs> and apparently it's a christening metal, Karen. <laughs> it's a baptismal metal with his name on it. John goes to the airport to try to talk to the senator. Well, it says St. Paul, September 8th, 1900, Joseph Patrick Carmichael. She wants, Claire wants to go to the police, but he says nobody's going to want to, nobody's going to believe him. They don't really have proof. Anybody could have put the metal there. Anybody could have put the bones there. There's no, he wants proof. So he wants to go see the senator. So he goes to meet him at the airport and he Acts rushes like a the lunatic. Yeah. And he's stopped by security. Of course. And the senator's plane takes off. Senator tells the pilot to radio to police headquarters and to have Captain DeWitt call him when they get to Spokane, I guess, is where they're going, I think he says. And we see the senator has a medal identical to the one John found. So then John arrives at home and all the doors slam. John yells, what do you want from me? He says he's done all he can. Next, we see Captain DeWitt coming to see John. Captain DeWitt questions John. He's not happy. Captain DeWitt thinks John has a blackmail scheme in mind. And John says, good day. Yes. <laughs> he says, give me the medal now, or I'll be back in an hour with a search warrant and we'll tear this place apart. And John and, says, I'll be here. <laughs> yeah. Basically, see you in an hour. <laughs> Claire arrives while DeWitt's there. She's not happy either. Claire tells John that his lease has been canceled and she has been forced to resign. Right here I wrote, 20 minutes left. <laughs> like he's got to find somewhere to hide that metal. See John walking around the house, looks in the mirror and the mirror smashes. And then we see DeWitt's face through a shattered windshield. Yeah, it took me a minute to see who that was. Phone rings, it's Claire. She stopped at a payphone, phone booth. And yes. tells John that the car belonging to Captain DeWitt, she saw overturned in the middle of the street, and Captain DeWitt is dead. You go. Senator Carmichael arrives back in Seattle. He calls to check his messages. He learns that DeWitt is dead, and he gets John's number. I guess he called and left it or whatever. John goes to visit the senator. Another nice house. Then we cut to Claire trying to call John. But she says, I think she's trying to call John. I wasn't sure. I think. And she says it's busy. It's busy. And then we see a light in that attic room come on. And we cut to John meeting with the senator. He shows him the uh, baptismal medal, as you called it, Karen. John tells Senator what he believes happened. And he says, the changeling is you. You know, explains the whole thing. You were swapped, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And then Senator tries to pay off John. Senator doesn't believe him. Senator doesn't seem to know anything about it. He is appalled that he would say such things about his father. Yeah, he says his father was a great man, a loving man. Loving the money is what he was. <laughs> but I got the feeling that the Senator always got kind of had a feeling something wasn't right. You know what I mean? Yeah, but didn't quite know. So this is where you think he doesn't know. But right. in the when he's on the plane, you think he does know. But now I'm thinking, mm, I don't think he does. I don't think he does. So then John 
he's a he's a nice guy. He gives the senator all of his information and the only tape of the seance. Yes, it says listen to it. And then Senator threatens John. He says, if he finds out he told anyone about this, he will wish he had not come into this world. <laughs> so then Claire arrives at John's house. She knocks on the door, but it opens for her. She goes in and begins looking for John. And she seems to follow John's voice. Yeah, it sounds upstairs. like a ventriloquist kind of thing happening. But I thought, like, why is, but she's a, a good, like, she's trying to help the boy and somehow he gets mad at her. I guess maybe things aren't moving fast enough or something. I don't know. Yeah. So she goes up to the room in the attic and then the wheelchair chases her down the stairs. I actually laughed when that happened. And Claire falls down the stairs. John arrives and takes Claire out of the house. But John goes back into the house to, even though Claire tries to stop him, but a wind pushes pushes him off a balcony. Karen. Yeah, see, I don't really get why is the ghost doing this? Like they're helping him. So what's I, I mean, it certainly picks up and the story picks up and all that. But but why is this? Is the ghost mad? They're not following through like they just gave everything to Carmichael and said, here's the information. I or, guess. But he's hurting the two people that were helping him. And flames come down the banister. <laughs> That was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. So then we cut to the senator looking at the two baptismal medals, as you call them. <laughs> the senator's That's what desk everyone calls them, not just me. Starts shaking. Well, I called it a christening medal. Aren't they called christening medals? <laughs> I think I they know. called it a baptismal. Okay. Medal, I, I like but... that better, actually. So then we all of a sudden see the senator at John's house walking up the flaming stairs. Yeah, I didn't know if John was hallucinating it or if the senator was hallucinating it or what was happening. And the stairs collapse and the chandelier swinging back and forth. But is he somehow finding out the truth? Like, it got confusing. I think, yeah, I guess. Uh, chandelier falls and almost hits John. Clara helps John get out of the house. I guess she's just been standing outside the door this whole time. <laughs> I yes. don't know. So then we see the senator at the room in the attic witnessing the murder again. And then we see him back at his office and he apparently has a heart attack. He gone. The thing is, though, if he didn't know, then he's not guilty. He's just a pawn in the whole thing. He is. I mean, he was an older man. He lived in, a, you know, a long life, not unlike the child who was murdered. But if he didn't know... Why did he have to have a heart? He didn't do anything either. A bunch of innocent people are being harassed and killed here all of a sudden. Well, that's what happens, Karen. <laughs> and there's an explosion from the attic room. And we see John and Claire arriving at the senator's mansion just in time to see him carried out, covered in a sheet, carried out to an ambulance. Ambulance drives away with the sirens going. And the ambulance drives past the burning house. Why are the sirens on and why are they in a hurry? Because it's the senator. It's already been know. pronounced dead. Apparently. apparently. Yeah. Next morning, apparently, burned remains of the house and a wheelchair is sitting among them, a charred wheelchair. Yes. And a charred music box opens and begins playing. Sequel. <laughs> Credits. The end. All right, Karen, what'd you think of the Snowdrift cocktail? Snow drift is delicious. It is. Mine evaporated about half an hour ago or an hour ago, maybe. <laughs> I wonder what it would taste like if you heated it up. Put a little marshmallow in there. Maybe powdered the rim with cocoa. Maybe, but they told you to keep <laughs> it cold. So I don't know, but it's delicious. That's for sure. Yeah, I think you they even put... keep it cold to maintain the snow drift. Oh, yes. The <laughs> crystals and things in it. Even vanilla vodka, I think, would be good in it, too. I used white chocolate liqueur. Oh, did you? That's all I have. So, yeah, it was good. Anything we learned today, Karen? We learned what a changeling was. We learned about microfilm, the space needle, Xeroxing. I think that's it. Is that it? Stained glass. Oh, stained glass. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready to move on to next week's film, Karen? We are. What do you got? 
Sadly, not another listener request. Uh huh. <laughs> wah, wah. Next film, Karen, I have chosen is 28 Days Later. Why did you choose that? Why? <laughs> what have you seen it before, Karen? No, I think it's going to be scary. Oh, well, as you do. Is it violent? It's probably extra violent, right? I don't know. I haven't seen it. 28 Days Later was released on November 1st, 2002. And our next episode comes out October 30th, Karen. It's the Halloween episode. I suppose. Not very Halloween-y, though. <laughs> well, that's your fault, not mine. I know. I could have picked any number of Halloween films. It's true, <laughs> but no. I have a cocktail as well, Karen. Excellent. What is it? It is called the Zombie Brain Shot. Nice. Something coagulate and something else. Is that what happens? Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're going to need Great. peach schnapps, cream de menthe, Bailey's Irish cream, and grenadine. And then what do you do? Fill a double shot glass with peach schnapps, Karen. One ounce. About halfway, which would be one ounce. And then we add a splash of cream de menthe. And then we place a small, small spoon over top of the shot glass, Ugh. upside down. I and, never can and, make these. <laughs> and pour Baileys over the back of the spoon so it slides off. Gotcha. And then we add a few dashes of grenadine, trying to aim for the bigger clumps of Baileys to make it look bloody. <laughs> <laughs> then we drink and enjoy, Karen. Oh, well, excellent. I don't know if I have a double shot glass. It's a, It's a variation of a brain hemorrhage shot so there you go so i'm sure we've all had a brain hemorrhage shot <laughs> sure <laughs> they were a big hit to one of my halloween parties way back in the day when I the used brain to hemorrhage them. shot or the yes. zombie one the brain hemorrhage shot were you a bartender at these things i was so did That's you get to I enjoy did. them or were you well, busy? i enjoyed them i was busy but i didn't Enjoyed them. Yeah, it was fun. Being the bartender, you probably get to see almost. But now one. I have a daughter who's a bartender. So if I had another one, <laughs> you wouldn't. Yes, you could get the pull, pull in the professional. Yeah, she was here at those. She was at those parties too, but she was not a bartender at that time. So good times, Karen. Good times. I wouldn't know, Greg. <laughs> so that'll be next week. Anyone you need to thank this week, Karen? Well, I think we need to thank our listener because, as you know, there are a lot of podcasts out there. So thanks for spending time with us. What about you, Greg? Who do you need to thank? I'm going to thank the great people of the Keystone State, Karen. Again? <laughs> Again. Apparently we're popular in Pennsylvania. And the band Verse 13 for providing all the music in the Scary Spirits podcast. And, of course, Tanya for picking this film and a cocktail. I know. Go Tanya. Woo woo. And the music definitely makes the podcast better. Anything else, Karen? Please drink responsibly. Yes. Thanks, Tanya. I think she'll listen to the end. I don't know. Thanks for listening to the Scary Spirits podcast, where the movies might be iffy, but the drinks are always solid. We would love to hear from you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Scary Spirits Podcast, or go to our website, scaryspirits.com. And if you want the direct line, email us at info at scaryspirits.com. If you really want to help us out, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And remember, always drink responsibly. See you next week.